Okay, folks, uh, thanks for being with us all day. Uh, we tried to put together a program that hits all the major topics that folks are talking about in Florida agriculture. Trade, 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 labor, 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 water, 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 a couple of new ones have to deal with disasters. What's going to happen in the legislation, uh, especially when uh, the major cuts in funding coming from the European USDA has some very big cuts at the federal level that are kind of disturbing. Of course, that doesn't mean that's the bill, but a number of challenges here. Uh, so I thought I'd start it off here and asking about trade, have our trade folks uh, maybe comment on it. Now, what are the three issues that keep you up at night about the current trade situation and where we're headed? Sure. I think the first issue um, to address is the Mexican subsidy issue. The first issue will be the Mexican subsidy issue. Actually, that's uh, creating a lot of uh, uh, impact on our industry because that obviously accelerated the uh, Info grow. And the same when I'm paid. So the challenge there is how do we provide a remedy or a threat or, or a stick to deal with how another country chooses to subsidize or encourage capacity building in production? Okay, how does capacity building? It's different from subsidizing production itself and reducing the production cost. So that is the phase on unfair competitive advantage. John, you have a so uh, you know, well, that's an issue that I've written about in the local press time. And that's yeah. You know, when as we approach trade, the worst thing that we can do is go into protectionism. Simply because I, I, I would contend that the reason we lost as much share as we have in the last few years is because we did a battle with no other change. We slowed down our own technological adoption. Uh, I've said before that, that our growers in a lot of places are doing the same things as their daddy did. And we can't do business like daddy did. The world's changing, and we see the transformation, for example, of tomatoes. The tomatoes, Mexico was, was, was a shipper of vine rice, and we were the shipper of, of, of mature greens. And they, they, the more that we have constrained, the more they have changed. And they now are the greenhouse growers, tech bag industry. And growing a product that, that, that challenges us. And, and, and so, as, as we look to trade, it's important that we ensure that there's fair trade. But it's also important that we, we don't get too lazy in what we're doing and don't look to the future and what we need to do for change. Get better at what we need. Mike? Yeah, I, I, I'd say. Uh, a global trade war. You go back to the causes of the Second World War, which was the tightening of trade barriers. So you have that that then forced Nazis into power. Well, you forced Nazis into power because they couldn't pay the reparations. And and the whole idea that that uh, imports are bad. Excuse me, the imports are, yeah, imports are bad, exports are good. And, you know, it's a, we really changed course, whereas we were going towards a more global society. I work insular, and it's how many miles you are from my house, whether I like you or not. Um, and therefore, I don't want to trade with you. And if everybody does that, then the world economy collapses. So what, that's what I do. Great. I guess I have a question for the group out here. Maybe I want to address Kevin. Kevin Morgan. As a representative of farmers, um, 
from my vantage point, I see an opportunity um, that the people that pay a grower can sell for a half. They, they are right now living under what I call a forced marriage with the coalition will not be working. And if I'm not going to grow anything, that only gets killed. Right? <laughs> 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 anyway, they are in a forced marriage with the coalition. And, but they, they've embraced the agreement and under what they call the fair food standards code of conduct. I see them getting no value for being a part of that agreement other than for escaping or getting rid of this negative PR that they've been damaged to with. Is there any chance that that could be turned into a positive? And there's nothing in Mexico that's going on in terms of the fair. And, 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 and how do you mention consumers, uh, consumer demand? Is there a chance that you, this right now, this bad situation can be turned into a positive? Even if we have to, even if the relationship between a fair grower and a coalition gets close. I would like to say yes, but no, I don't think there's a good chance of that. Bad marriage is a bad marriage, right? There's no counseling involved in it. I just see that as a market opportunity, and I would like to see some chances to look at that perception that you know, if, if people are if consumers are concerned about how workers are being treated, this is a pretty substantial program that the workers have. If you combine that with uh, pictures of the child labor in Mexico that's still going on, that could work. In the same advertisement or the same marketing strategy. If you juxtapose the two of them together, I think it would work well. But where does that leave the, uh, the child in Mexico when they don't have any? Because that's two of them. That would come up as well. Mm -hmm. So, well, let's go to the labor. Uh, you painted a very challenging picture for Florida agriculture. What's the good news out there on the ag labor in Florida agriculture? Good news. Good news may be some <laughs> 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 and the politicians are realizing that agriculture really is a huge issue and they're trying to address that by imposing uh, different kind of uh, reform, generation reform. How about on the trade for the trade folks? What, what is the good news? Is there any good news for the trade folks? It's very simple. We're being faced with a challenge that's going to force us to change. It's going to force us to change. We can't. If we don't get engaged and we don't do something, then we're not going to exist the way we have. And we don't want anything different in Florida. I mean, we, 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 if, if we're not involved in, in, in agriculture, what are we going to do? And if, if it happens, the tomatoes, it's going to happen to every vegetable industry. Citrus industry faces the same kind of challenges. Uh, we're looking at, at, at what's going on in, in the other segment. I think we, we've got, we are being challenged. I think we can respond. All we got to do is support the, the, the people that can create that change. And that, that takes, you know. So at the outset, you know, I, I made a comment uh, as I made some opening remarks about how you folks are on on the ground at the forefront of what's happening and any changes that are happening. We see the day of late. Uh, we're later. And the same thing can be said almost for government policy. A lot of our policies are based on country to country type relationships. For example, uh, U.S. trading with Mexico. Well, the reality is. The U.S. does not trade with Mexico. It's a firm in the U.S. trades with a firm in Mexico. Uh, but legislation, the laws, and protection aren't oriented in this way. 
And as the world was more globalized with NAFTA, we have Florida producers are producing in Florida, they're producing in Mexico, they're producing in many places. Bristol's is on five different continents. They look at a map of the world. Uh, these firms are now transnational. How do we deal with these challenges? Of these are the these are the this is the globalized world we have, but we have policies, uh, regulations, directives that don't recognize that that's the nature of movement of, of goods and services. Well, I'll, yes. one, I'll go offer one yeah. bit of good news is that think back what we were, where were we in 2008? You remember where you were during the start of the financial crisis in 2008? Did you have questions that the whole system would collapse? I mean, if you took a vote at that time, people who watched thought that we might not survive that system. And so it took us a couple of years of down from that. But people forget where you were at that time and how far we've come back. Now we're basically at full employment. We've got lots of technology that's about online to, to change things a great deal in, throughout the world. Uh, our regulations are probably softening from what they were set up to, to uh, combat against that got in, us into trouble in 2008. But it's, but it's a whole lot better in that perspective. But you do, you're always in a situation, as Spiro says, you've got regulations that are set up and then companies and individuals move around and change their operations to take advantage of those regulations as best they can. So you're always trying to change things to improve the pattern. And you know, generally the companies have the smartest people. And, and so they get, they're gonna do their thing. And so it's a dynamic process. But we're in a pretty good place now, not only in the United States in terms of our macro economy, but in the rest of the world too. Thanks. Uh, on water, uh, Ray, what's the good news? Um, I, I mean, one of the most positive things that, that I'm aware of is really, the, the real advances in technology that are occurring in agriculture. Um, in fact, just yesterday, I was at a precision Yeah, I'm not. I'm not involved with it day to day. I go to these things like a new cloud factory. It's like you know, the amazing kind of things that are going on. And that I'm not sure that they will necessarily be sufficient to to meet the, the challenges that we face, particularly on the quality side. But it, it, it gives me optimism that we can make new progress. <coughs> What about the legislative initiatives that have taken place recently, like a statewide planning for water use? We have the water districts operating separately. Now they have to be the modeling, the uh, estimating the demand for water has to be harmonized across the state. Is that a, is that a good news? I'm trying to remember you had that acronym. Uh, Florida statewide estimated water demand I mean, I think one of the things that, that in terms of sort of fostering more of a, a not necessarily a statewide approach, but you could say multi district approach, you could see the, the two efforts I mentioned the Central, Central Florida Water Initiative and then the North Florida Water Pump Initiative. And, and not only in the planning, in the CF5, CF that we are, for example, um, there was a legislative directive in the 2016 legislation that the district had to develop consistent rules for that, for that region. And certainly, a lot of people, whether they like this or don't like it, uh, kind of see the Greek writing on the wall that you know, that's going to be.
I mean, I think in terms of meeting particularly the water supply challenge, I think we have to think beyond the challenge. I just, you know, I think we need to look at the state as a whole and what the needs are and how. I mean, the, the water supply plant process up until now, it was in the, our current system was dated many years. And up until now, it's been, you know, this kind of balance of what's kind of thing. These are the demands we have in the future, and you know, here's a bunch of projects that are compared to the dead. The CFWI, in my, in my mind, took an additional step in developing an actual implementation strategy and really be much more serious about, okay, what can we actually do? So, you know, I think we're kind of headed in the right direction. To, uh, I've been to several conferences out west in the last couple of years, and I come back and say, boy, you know, they would, they would love to have our water problem. <laughs> the uh, CFWI came about the genesis of that was South Florida issuing permits. And St. John says they're going to hurt us. This is going to impact us. And South Florida saying, hey, we're doing what we're entitled to do. And St. John gets into a lawsuit with them. Jeb was the governor at the time. And he said, if you all can't get along, we're going to have a statewide water management district. If you all can't settle this and work it out. And that's where the CFWI came about. And it also included Southwest. And we're working along later time, but it really was saying there's got to be cooperation between you guys. You can't, you know, work in a vacuum independent of, of you know, your neighbors. Or, and then it became just uh, one guy that became part of uh, law and thought about 2016 in the water bill. I think the most important part about CFWI was not only bringing three men, water management districts together, but they brought the public piece, the agricultural piece. These people spent Days and days and days. And I was there, so I have the background of behavior change, which that's always interesting. To see how that was all going to, you know, we wanted to make sure they could all figure out how to put things on the table that are actually attainable in a shorter amount of time because there's cost involved, there's convenience involved, there's behavior in your mind cannot do this, you know. So they spent a lot of time, and we met. Sometimes week after week, sometimes it was every month, but it went on for about two years. And that's that's a lot of planning. But it also shows that if you have buy-in from all the players, and they're not all these people you want to play in the same sandbox with, but you die in at the same time and you figure it out together, you can move forward with a product that, that has potential. Uh, so uh, I guess one of those mind is uh, the Florida Water Thought Program, the transportation program. What they do is uh, they set my home, so we build this in some of these public towns probably five to probably five for a water star uh, transportation that they do. So also um, they have the same programs where homeowners can be given grants or actually less tables by giving the grants to the vice homeowner, which their uh, rents gets into uh, water saving. So uh, policies make up there on the overhead. Uh, one of the, the needs for policies when folks can't get it to work on their own. When the private sector can't make it work and there's a failure in, in how the system works, like we talked about the water, then we need policy to come in to help bridge bridge those gaps to help make everyone coordinate, play better together, and make it clear. And so it's not always in the interest of everyone to cooperate. Jamie, John Wall, you're, that's where you're playing. You're looking at how are these policies being formulated, what are being proposed, how to advocate. Please, what's the good news that you see? <laughs> <laughs> I was here on the federal side, and I won't be making a different take, but it's very refreshing right now to work in the national legislative issues um, compared to years past for the district that would not listen to anything we have to say. Um, we could voice our concerns and fall on deaf ears, but with this new administration in the White House, 
um, and an administration that will listen and that is cognizant of our concerns and our needs um, on an agricultural level is very refreshing. And to have a Congress that is physically doing things um, it makes our job, you know, interesting and exciting. Um, and we feel like we're working towards something and actually accomplishing things. Um, where in the past, gosh, we would work and work and work and it would go nowhere. Um, also an administration that is realizing that the regulations that have been imposed on farmers and ranchers are burdensome. Um, on the EPA side, especially, and Charlie Shins here and can talk about WOTUS, I'm sure. Um, but not only WOTUS, but pesticide regulations um, and reviews of those, and really um, putting administrators in place that are cognizant of agriculture's needs is refreshing at the federal level. Um, I would say on the state level and both on the federal, it's really interesting to see um, young, energetic people coming to the industry of agriculture for work. Um, young people that are energized about this industry, whether they grew up in the industry or did not, um, that have a love for it and a passion for it. It's just really promising that um, we have those young people coming through Farm Bureau or, or through FNGLA, FFBA or others, you know, on your young, young farmer and rancher program. So not only producers of commodities, but also people in positions like John Walt and I that advocate for those producers and are their voices um, when they have to be in the field and, and we can advocate on their behalf. So that's really promising um, that we have another generation of those people that are gonna be able to stand up for our farmers and ranchers for years to come. And I would just echo that by saying, you know, we have enhanced opportunities in this day and age, regardless of whether you think uh, on the NAFTA front or the immigration front or any other policy area, um, the door has been opened. Um, and we are optimistic that the chance can be taken advantage of to improve uh, where in areas where there needs to be improvement. And to go off of Dr. Van Sickle's point earlier, you know, he talked about, you know, force, force change. Um, and I thought of that in the terms of immigration too. You know, you verify whether at the state level through a constitutional amendment or at the federal level paired with guest worker legislation, um, we are being forced as an industry to change not only on that front, but in other facets uh, of policymaking and industry regulation. Um, but I'm optimistic at how engaged we are as an industry from the grassroots level um, beyond. Um, and that's, that's really exciting to see. On uh, these disasters that come up and the damages they do to the, the ag sector, I believe I saw the uh, USDA Secretary Purdue stating that uh, he doesn't believe in disaster aid. Uh, part of being in farming is, he didn't say this part, but part of being in farming implicitly is rolling with these, with these events. Uh, you folks, Krista, Alan, you kind of articulate what the scope of damages from just one event can be. Uh, and you articulated the first stage of, of those damages. So how do you, can you give us any insight for the second stage? How, how do we go about estimating that and providing intelligence, economic intelligence to policymakers as they start to see, okay, what is needed to bridge those, those events? Wow. It's, uh, well, I think first of all, we need to be able to communicate what the, what the value and the economic benefits of, of agriculture and natural resources are. Resources are. I spent spent the better part of my career trying trying to do that to document the really significant uh, impact that agriculture does have in this state and and many other states. Uh, even so, I think we still sometimes that message doesn't get through. Uh, got a lot of a lot more legislative legislators to educate about what the value of agriculture is and it is it is a special industry it's not uh, the tie to the natural resource and the land base is different than most other industries these are assets that cannot be uh, cannot be 
manufactured. These are natural endowments that we have to live with and that those things have, resources have to be protected. So I think agriculture does have a unique role um, and there, there is a, a place for these uh, uh, support mechanisms to help sustain those resources. Krista, do you want to add something? Yeah, so I, I think that even if, even if there's not disaster relief, right, there's still an opportunity to um, use policy to fund efforts that are disaster risk reduction or resiliency. And, and I think that's what uh, Florida saw a lot of that after Hurricane Andrew. Um, so I don't think it takes, there's a lot of different tools in the toolbox that can be used. And I don't think it has to be disaster relief for each and every event if we were able to put more effort towards um, risk reduction and risk management. The way, you do it, disasters happening. the way you do it in the private sector is you buy insurance. Buy insurance. Right, to deal with those, those, those such, such mm -hmm. events. So you're kind of articulating we need a toolbox that is, uh, is like our insurance mm -hmm. uh, portfolio. Uh, let's open up to the audience. Have any questions you'd like to direct here to our panel? <clears throat> Just real quickly along the line of what you were just talking about, do most farmers have insurance or not? It depends on the crop. It depends on the crop, yeah. Some crops yeah. are. It's the, the best the, answer. The, the farm program crops are covered in the 80 to 90 percent level. And, but when you get down to vegetables where we've got the high risk, I mean, we're, we're down in the 30s, 20s on some of those crops. I mean, so it depends on the crop. It depends. And, and the program. And where you are. <clears throat> if the program's gonna be beneficial for you. If the NAP, let's, let's talk about NAP. Yeah, okay. NAP for specialty crop. Um, if the cost of. Non insurable. Non insurable. Yeah. Okay. So not a row crop, for instance, right. like. Okay. Um, so a specialty crop would use NAP coverage. Um, and if the NAP coverage cost to them is not worth the risk, um, and for instance, if they lost everything, would it pay for it? Would it pay for it? Probably not. So that's not worth taking. So it depends on the quality of the program as well, not just the crop. Um, Gilly, you have a question? Well, I know there's a question as well as an asking for help. Um, because you start, you start to know that I have seen on you, the, the, the panel, what, you know, keep, keep them up at night. And um, it's something that, yeah, that, that actually um, hits me up also is as a trade economist, trade in the department, gone through all of the <clears> arguments <throat> for trade, which were drilled in me. And then I know what my growers want to hear right now as far as trade is concerned. How do I go about explaining, you know, <laughs> to the growers? <laughs> what they want to hear as against <laughs> all of the arguments. Do I use, come back and use those arguments of, well, food is a national security issue, a food security issue, and therefore, you know, that's all the argument which we probably debunked during our trade courses or whatever it is. So that is the sort of bipolar thing that I, that, that keeps me up at night trying to come up with that. But the point I think um, that was raised there, I mean, how can you compete if you're paying six to five dollars a day for labor compared to a country that is paying eight dollars per day for, for labor? Um, then it's just regardless of what subsidy or whatever it is, it's hard to compete against that from a, from a, a, a because of your cost of production. So I don't know if there's a, what I'm asking for is help. How do I explain it to the growers? Or do I refer back to a national security issue and, and support that and say, well, you know, food is part of this, when we should be protecting it, or going back to something? Because I, I need to explain it. Help Kelly. So, I don't know if that was going to help Kelly. Move to Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> Part of it's just recognizing where our strengths and weaknesses are and the resources that we've got to use. 
And if we don't capitalize on those resources that we've got a comparative advantage on, then we're losing those opportunities. And you, quite frankly, where it comes with, with, with our competition, where do we have that advantage? One of them is right there in Sherry. I'm looking at the Dean for Research, Associate Dean for Research, that, that, that we, we are at, advan at an advantage in developing technologies that will allow us to capitalize on those resources where we, we have an advantage and, and to minimize the impact of those that we don't. I mean, if we're not, if we're not working on labor saving technologies, then we're not working in the right area. We need to do those things that make us more productive, that don't have, that, that don't require as many of those resources where somebody else has got an advantage. So, so we should not so much to trade as the technology and, and where we focus and along the lines of what maybe what the senior vice president would say that maybe we want to look at some technology that we can package, mm -hmm. you know, that will give us a soft mm -hmm. edge inside of it. And less on the issue of trying to put in place yes. those trade policies that will <laughs> give us an edge. I mean, in the long run, how how is the situation that you talk about viable unless there's tremendous differences in productivity. How can you afford to pay someone $65 an hour that gets the same amount of work in another country for $9 an hour? Or at least their equivalent of that. I mean, we run into that in the cold. And in the signal that you send, if you send, if you allow and you subsidize coal, now I can say this in Florida, maybe. Uh, they don't allow me to talk in public audiences in Kentucky anymore. Um, but but so so you allow that to happen because of your policies. You can go in and work in a coal mine and have a you know not graduate from high school, work in a coal mine, have one of the most dangerous jobs in the country, and that's what you want. That's you want to design policies that encourage your people to do that. Is that a good long run policy, or is it better that you you face the fact that in You've got to do something to make you more competitive, and that is through technology or through education or something else that's going to make it so that you don't have to have some distortions of prices. I teach my cl classes, prices are the signals that tell you what to do. And, and, and if you send the wrong signals, the policy distorts those signals, then it's going to store all your resource allocation. It's going to store your economy. Remember, policy crisis have two signals: scarcity and a time to innovate. Right? So those, you know, that's part of our incentive system. Sir, so, uh, I'm not on the panel, so maybe I'm you guys out of turn. But to answer your question, in urbanizing areas like Central Florida and, and Miami, uh, which I think is where you're located. Uh, HUD views food security as a, as a legitimate marketing uh, technique for local food systems. Uh, here in Central Florida, we have 3 million people living within 50 miles of Orlando, and we've got a 30 day supply of food in the warehouses and grocery stores. Well, I mean, if nothing happens and the food keeps coming in, we're fine. But if not, then we need to, we need to make local food systems a priority with local governments and, and the population. Uh, when we have a disaster, when you think about how quickly the food comes off the shelf when Irma, Irma came through, uh, five days and, and the shelves are empty, uh, and then there's limited, maybe 10 or 15 days worth in the warehouse. So depending on how long it takes for the food to get back to resupply, uh, I think food systems, uh, local food systems and food security is a legitimate marketing tool. Well, there's, there's one more that I don't know what you really talked about. And that's a health and wellness related policy of we want fruits and vegetables uh, well, we're part of the food pyramid now it's likely but there are so many servings of fresh fruits and vegetables one should have as part of a good diet in the u.s as prescribed by usda and many other countries and so you could play that health and wellness policy as well as a food security policy but you know that's only only so far so one of the, you know, when we're talking about labor costs, I think it's strawberries, they pay, please correct me, 
the labor costs can be up to 45% of your total cost in yeah, strawberries. Around 40%. Around 40% of your cost of production is labor. Okay, well, and we have such wide disparities. Yeah, that's, that's good. It's only a chance. Have you had a chance to eat at the Rusty Spoon in downtown Orlando? Hamburgers are $18 a piece, and it's uh, local uh, grass fed beef <coughs> and all local food in the restaurant. It's an upscale downtown restaurant. So. Eighteen dollar hamburger. Right? <laughs> 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 Other yeah, or maybe one another. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. In relation to the high signal comments and the earlier question about the uh, uh, trading between countries or trading within multinational companies, I feel like uh, you know this. Uh, you know, agriculture is really different. Um, we can, sometimes economics doesn't work. For example, how do you measure food security of a certain country? Although, but multinational companies are driven by profit most of the times. But within, between countries like Mexico, now they can't even guarantee their, their, their corn supply. Like more than 60% of their corn is supplied by uh, Midwest United States producers. And that's a food security issue. Mexico. I, in this case, you know, they can't even say that's good for, Me for Mexico, right? And in another dimension, you know, the economics doesn't work um, where, you know, it, that's, that's environment. Because agriculture is very much related to the environment, ecosystem services, and open space we enjoy. And yeah, those things have value, right? It's, although it's not traded on the market, uh, there's a value of those uh, services we enjoy. So I, every time when, when, you know, when countries strike a trade agreement, agriculture is the most difficult part. It has a reason well, for that. Uh, well, that's, that's been the case for since trade agreements were first struck, is that agriculture part has always been the hardest part to negotiate uh, you know, to get the agreement to conclusion. So, so, but it's, yeah, so isn't it pro trade statement then going back to Gilly's, um, what Gilly said about uh, being trained in um, that, that uh, trade liberalization is positive for the economy, right? So um, I, I feel like uh, sometimes when it comes to trade discussions, uh, there are some underlying other reasons that don't have to do with the economics. Mm -hmm. Because if we're talking about food security, then then uh, trade liberalization that proves to be uh, the way to go, and, and the other other way around is not. Well, what we tend to see in economies is you know, there's a lot of outsource, offshore outsourcing of a lot of manufacturing. Clearly, the United States, much less than 20 percent of our GDP, is from manufacturing. The rest comes from services. The one that does not get outsourced is a lot of food manufacturing, a lot of food production. So, so there's always that kind of a break because we, we need to be able to maintain our supply and there's, a, there's always going to be a, like a, don't call it food security, I just call it a homeland security you know, issue here. So, but when you start to outsource your production, you can't keep all the R&D here and have your production outsourced. So you're almost going to lose your R&D as well. We see that with a lot of countries that have outsourced their, their manufacturing. They've also lost their R&D capacity for those same industries. So you, know, you, you get into the cycle that you have to kind of look at with your eyes wide open and start to make these choices. But you know, these are all these challenges are challenges that say the, there's a need for a policy discussion and what kind of policy remedies may be appropriate in some cases and in some cases not. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, um, I'm Lenny. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, not a member, I'm not in the industry. I'm a planner. And I just want to know if there has been any impact on the agricultural labor force due to the influx of uh, Puerto Rican Puerto Rican population after the 
Hurricane Maria, and if there is any impact in Central Florida, and please reach. I don't. I don't know if anyone has done any research on that, but I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Yep, Fritz. Your, your question is about uh, folks from Puerto Rico entering Florida, entering the workforce. Right. Uh, I can't speak to that. I'm sure that it's happening um, because I think I know I know in the in past years the H2A program is being utilized by by folks from Puerto Rico and as U.S. citizens or as rights as a U.S. Uh, legal resident, if they wanted to get a job with an H2A employer in Florida, they had every right to request that job and the employer would pay the earlier. And come over, so that that's been there for them all along. Um, I'm sure with the hurricane, I can only say yes, but I don't have any numbers to tell you how many X number of people have gotten the job. But yes, I'm sure there are a lot of people from Puerto Rico. So no, just to put another point on that, um, a lot of folks from Haiti have been working in our agricultural fields um, under the with the trade uh, temporary protected yeah, status, mm -hmm. which has now been expired. Expired, so that might go away, but. At least in Amakli, I've heard from several vegetable growers that they haven't had this issues of labor shortages that they maybe once had because these folks are now working and they're legal. So, uh, Lenny, that's one of the challenges here. You, you're wondering about hurricane Maria refugees on the table. Yes, coming here. Right. So, realistically, this is a case of we won't know that data for probably nine months after they get here. That's the only, that's really the reliable time that you would start to see it. If anyone gets, whenever they put out a number that says what unemployment is in February, and they do that in a week or two, that number is absolute garbage. That is not the real number. The real number will be, to be settled seven months from now. So you know, they're getting an estimate, uh, but so we won't, the sad thing is we won't know unless someone has gone through some, some survey. I'm not familiar with anyone who's done that yet. I would I'd, I'd like to add to that. It depends on my question being, are, are citizens of Puerto Rico like citizens of Florida? Um, they have options that other folks don't have. So yeah, they're going to come here and get jobs. But how many of them want to get jobs in agriculture? So I would I would argue that they have the same preferences and biases that that you know in continentals. Folks have had all along. So, any other questions or comments? Okay, well, what, we're really at time. Well, anyway, let's uh, thank our panel and <laughs> thank you for letting me put you on the spot. And so, uh, this is our third policy outcome. <laughs> Uh, I'm trying to highlight why policy is important. What's the need for policy? That's not trying to make folks do things. I'm trying to actually use policy as a bridge to make systems work better. Uh, sometimes some systems just break down because all the incentives can't be captured within normal interactions. And so there's a role for policy to step in. Agriculture is a classic case for policy. Plays a pretty big role. Farmers, uh, farm producers face a lot of risk. Uh, one of the signals for innovation is trying to manage risk as well. Uh, we can support the agriculture by funding of ICAS and groups like that and organizations like ICAS to do research, to create innovation, to help make new varieties and when you deal with scientists all the time, that I guess like I do, they think you have to innovate or die, and every solution is a supply curve. And if you're an economist or a marketer, you start to think that it's either you differentiate or die. How do I differentiate my product from others? That's the way I can have higher value. And you know, folks have demands and things they want. And Zig Zay was talking about um, green space. You know, what's the value of green space? Well, as we get to be a more affluent society, you know, that's important to us. And it's important for us to know where our food comes from. And it's important to know, to be able to know 
that was the ecological impact of that of that food production. A lot of people place value on that. You can't open up a can of tuna fish and identify it as being salty and safe. But you know, I want to see that. That's that has value. So thinking about what are the demand drivers here as well as what are the great innovations that come up. So what our scientists do with their innovations, they kind of expand the set of what is possible. Economists come in and say, okay, given what's possible, what's optimal? So what's the decision? Where is there going to be the decision environment that we need to play? And those are the lot of the things that were being discussed today. So again, we really appreciate you taking a day out to come here to our conference. We're going to be doing it next year. Uh, we'll take it on the road somewhere. But uh, thanks again, and we hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great and I want to thank you again, Emrek, and Alan Todd just did a fantastic job in organizing the panel here and the whole program. <laughs> Please uh, fill out the uh, survey form for us.